Hi, I'm Savannah Jones, and today we're speaking with Jeff Robley, a Divisional Vice President of Technology at Press Tech in New Hampshire. Jeff, let's talk about Press Tech and the solutions you're providing for your customers. Press Tech uh, was started out as Newell Precision back in the 60s already. Uh, it's a predecessor company, uh, and it was uh, a Newell Precision split off uh, over over the time since the 60s, had went through several different ownerships. The original founder of, Pre of Neural Precision was a fellow named Don Bram. And after his non-compete expired, he started Presatech. And both Pneumo Precision and, and Prestec were famous for making air bearings and air bearing rotary stages, precision motion, air bearing linear stages. And one of the um, biggest needs for precision motion is uh, manufacturing of optics by the means of diamond machining. And uh, diamond tools really have a magical property with certain materials, particularly non-ferrous metals, but also different uh, plastic uh, some synthetic materials, where you can create an optical surface wherever you place the diamond tool relative to the workpiece and get an optical finish that doesn't require any polishing from direct machining. That's very unlike traditional optics where you're grinding, grinding polish glass, for instance. And why is that important? So you can make better and better optics, the better and better you can position the tool relative to the workpiece, because wherever that tool is, that's where the, where the surface is going to be generated on the surface. And uh, so that's driven the precision of our ability to position the tools. So Presatech is all about, in the end, uh, taking the pieces that were originally developed at Pneumo Precision and at Presatech to, to, for precision motion control to actually position a diamond tool and also positioning a workpiece that's spinning at high speed very accurately and bringing the two together, machining material off, and at the end you have a finished optic with, that doesn't require any polishing at all. And the, also the beauty of diamond turning is that you have a range of different tool shapes and you can make very structured surfaces and odd surfaces that you couldn't do by traditional optics manufacturing. And I would say the advent of diamond turning uh, drove the acceptance of aspheric optics. Uh, before there were, when I started my career in the late 70s, it was pretty unusual for people to design in uh, aspheric optics. With the advent of diamond turning, we can diamond turn an asphere just as easily as a spherical optic. And, um, and then we can actually, so we've gone beyond that now to do more and more complex shapes. So we've focused on taking these building blocks, Presatech historically, before my time, in the 60s even, a precision motion control and applied it to making optics. And that's our primary focus today. And we have offshoots in, in the Sterling product line for making ophthalmic lenses using the same fundamental uh, positioning of a tool with respect to the workpiece. Jeff, you've been involved with diamond turning since the early development of LLNL, which you mentioned earlier. What would you say are some of the challenges your customers working on advanced applications are facing in manufacturing optics using single point diamond turning? The advent of, as I was talking earlier, the, the proper name now, single point diamond turning, as opposed to multiple point diamond tools like grinding tools, we actually have a precision a fabricated single crystal diamond. It's a gem quality diamond that's used uh, to create the surfaces and to cut these non-ferrous materials on our, on our machines. And the early research into this went, dated back to Philips in, in the Netherlands in the, in the late 40s and 50s, because they, they could precision shape diamond crystals. You know, close proximity to Amsterdam and Antwerp helped with that, the diamond industry there. One of the first pioneers of using diamond tools on a machine tool to um, make precision artifacts, not necessarily optics, was Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And I was fortunate to have uh, done my summer internship as an undergraduate in 1977, is when I started my relationship there. Livermore started with diamond, single point diamond turning already back in the mid 60s, I'd say. And so I was fortunate enough to start my career with some of the very early pioneers in the United States in this technology. And we've taken it from there. <laughs> uh, and I have to say, I stayed at Livermore through 1990, since went, spent some time at Carl Zeiss in Germany, also doing diamond turning, then moved on to Polaroid in Cambridge, also doing diamond turning and optics manufacturing. Everywhere I went, I was a customer of Presatech. And in fact, uh, 
Lawrence Livermore National Lab is part of the Department of Energy, and they had actually got funding in, 19, in the 1979, 1980, to do technology transfer uh, to uh, private industry because from the department, I think it was the Department of Navy, because um, at that time, anybody that wanted to diamond turn anything, they had to home build a machine. So we, we were doing custom made home built machines at Livermore. There was a few of the other early pioneers, Union Carbide, even uh, Zeiss in Germany, Polaroid in the early 70s was making home built diamond turning machines. There was no one place you could go and buy one. It was not, no commercial market for that. And so my colleagues at Livermore, starting in 79 and 90, did this, had this program called the Machine Tool uh, uh, technology transfer program where they worked with private industry to, to transfer the technology developed at Livermore through, the, through that time, private industry to, to make commercially available diamond turning machines. And one of the companies they worked with was Numa Precision. And that was the predecessor to Presatec. And uh, so and the first diamond turning machines that Numa Precision made and sold were to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So it was a collaboration already going back to Pneumo Precision. And in all these places I worked, I was either a customer of Pneumo Precision or Presatec. Uh, and so it became kind of a, a no-brainer to finally join Presatec in 2002 is when I, when I started here. And because uh, I'd been working with them for decades and uh, was involved in some of the, the first machines that, that Pneumo Precision had made for the diamond turning market. Let's hear more about those early days. The early days, it was purely uh, two-axis machining. Uh, so you're making axisymmetric surfaces, surface revolution, so A-spheres would call, fall in that category, Fresnel optics. Uh, and that was the main forte of what we were doing at Livermore also. Um, then I got involved in this project called the Large Optics Diamond Turning Machine Project. And it's, still, it's a very large special purpose lathe for, for chemical laser optics. And um, is still considered the most accurate lathe ever built of that size, 1.65 meter swing. We developed a fast tool servo for that. It's one of the first fast tool servos, and at that time wasn't made. wasn't It was a very short travel, only two and a half microns, and it was intended to correct for repeatable errors in the lathe, not to create unique shapes to it. But in in the end, as, after we finished the the optics on large opt, on LODTM. Uh, for the, this was part of an um, Air Force Weapons Lab program. Uh, we started experimenting making freeform surfaces on that same lathe using fast tool servos and also con controlled motion of the z-axis as a function of angle of the, of the spindle. So that's XZC turning, or some people call it slow tool servo turning. So it was early days of that. We were able to make wavefront correctors. It was one of the first applications. Uh, another one was to, uh, one of the first applications for a freeform surface at Livermore um, was to simulate turbulence in the atmosphere. Uh, so like a wavefront corrector for uh, lasers propagating through the atmosphere. Uh, and those were quite successful. And uh, but it took a lot of time and a very expensive machine. So by the time, uh, I, and even in my time at, uh, at Zeiss, we would, occasionally we would do three axis turning. We have two linear axes, an X and a Z axis. The, the axial and radial axes of motion, but you might combine it with a rotary axis, a B axis, that could use keep the tool pointed normal to the surface. And a lot of the early diamond turning machines, in fact, uh, DTM one and two at Livermore had a B axis to do tool normal machining, and that was because you couldn't get good quality diamonds. And so the one of the largest error sources was the waviness on the edge of the diamond. And so if you always use the same point in the diamond, that eliminated that error source. But as diamond, diamonds got better, there was less need for that, kind of went away for that. Uh, but we were doing, when I was, my time at, uh, at Zeiss, we were doing some of the first diffractive lenses uh, um, for uh, infrared optics, for instance, uh, kinoforms, and uh, redirect machining diffractive structures on top of a, uh, a refractive surface, like in germanium. These were transmissive lenses in the infrared. We were doing some of the first uh, diffractive lenses for infrared there during my time there in, in the early 90s. As you mentioned, you've been in the industry in one form or another since the 70s and worked with many companies and eventually you made your way to Polaroid in the 90s. All the time I was at Zeiss, we just did axisymmetric surfaces, though, whether they're A-spheres or diffractives. Finally, uh, 
we started doing some freeform surfaces at uh, Polaroid. And the first commercial use of a true freeform surface was in the uh, SX-70 camera. It, was, it predated me, uh, my time at Polaroid when I joined them in, in 1994. Uh, back in the 80s, I was a very successful camera, and they had a, 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 a special focusing lens that was represented by a fifth order polynomial. And they did that by raster grinding and a lot of polishing and steel, not with a diamond tool. And that was the only technology at the time. So they measured and polished. It could take weeks and weeks to converge on a, this crazy shape. Uh, that kind of surface, a more general freeform surface, the needs for that have been growing uh, in recent years. In fact, the time I joined Presitech in 2002, uh, we were wanting to do more odd freeform shapes more quickly. And there's a whole class of them. Uh, like these focusing lenses uh, called Quintix or sometimes Alvarez lenses for focusing. People might, or might be familiar with the, the, um, the type of lens from Louis Alvarez. Let's explore that more, the beginning of freeform shapes and some of their uses. It's an extra degree of freedom for an optical designer. And really uh, designing non axisymmetric surfaces generally for freeform. The design tools for, op for optical designers weren't there in the, in the 90s. Polaroid did a lot of their own development in the, in the 80s on it, but you couldn't buy commercial optical design software. So we didn't see many demands because people didn't know how to design them into it. But once they got some of the tools for designing it, they could, these freeform surfaces that had no axis of symmetry now, that's my definition, uh, relaxed some of the design parameters so that they could either improve the optical performance of, a, of an instrument or an optical system or make it more compact. That was important for Polaroid cameras because it had to be very lightweight and compact and, and image across a large piece of instant film. And, and as you fold optics, it, you have to correct for the image distortion. And the best way to do that was with freeform optics. So at, at the time uh, I joined, around the time I joined Presitech in 2002, uh, we, we'd been looking at freeform surfaces that are close to being axisymmetric but deviate a bit. Uh, toric lenses might be an example where you have uh, astigmatism, trying to correct for astigmatism, power in one direction different than the, the other direction. And there, you could use a fast tool servo, which uh, uh, Presitech and uh, Numa Precision actually started the first applica commercial applications of fast tool servos for direct lathing of contact lenses using fast tool servos in the, in the already in the, um, in the mid 90s. Um, and I think, uh, and this allows very rapid production of non axisymmetric surfaces by rapidly positioning the tool as a function of angle. But also, if you want to do something longer travel and then want the expense of a, of a fast tool servo, you could use the main Z axis of the machine. And we were calling that slow tool servo. I don't really like that name because the slides are still moving pretty fast. Uh, so I like to call it XZC turning because uh, it's three axis turning. You can create a whole uh, class of freeform surfaces that are being close to axisymmetric. Um, so it depends on the, on the excursion. Uh, we, we've done uh, some mild toric surfaces up to 2,000 RPM using the Z axis moving in and out twice per revolution. So now it sounds like the processes are getting simpler and more streamlined. So that was just starting to catch on when I started here in 2002. And, and now that brought the cost down for making molds or optics directly for, for mild freeform surfaces. You know, like an almost an order of magnitude because you could just do it on a normal turning machine just using the extra axis, the C axis, which is the rotary axis of the workpiece, and match the tool. Or uh, I could tell people <laughs> anything you could do with XCC turning, you can do with a fast tool servo, as long as you stay within the travel limits of the fast tool servo, but you can do it 10 to 15 times the speed. So it's the speed thing. Uh, that, there's another class of freeform surfaces where you can't use XZC turning th one rotary axis and two linear axes. The more general case is using three linear axes, X, Y, Z. And, um, and again, starting in about, just before I joined Presitech in the late 90s, uh, press start coming out with a machine with a with a vertical linear axis and the two horizontal axes. There you can position a spinning tool. We call that fly cutting. With the, with the diamond tool spinning, a single still a single point tool but spinning. 
and then you can move that over the surface and create very arbitrary freeform surfaces. Like one application is an F theta lens, which is used to focus for laser printing or laser scanning. You have a, a, uh, but if you want to take a spinning laser and focus it on a piece of paper to write or scan on it, it requires a lens to take that sweeping laser beam and focus it down to a tight spot on a piece of paper going, and that's called an F theta lens. It's a very crazy freeform shape, large uh, changes of shape, and the only way to do that was with three, you can't do that by XCC turning. And uh, so it's, yeah, applications like that, uh, early days of rear projection television also had some crazy freeform surfaces where you couldn't do it by spinning the workpiece. You had you really needed three linear axes. There's two classes of, freeform surfaces I like to talk about, and we Presitech does, does both. And we've been advancing those a lot in the last 20 years since I joined Presitech, so.